Mackenzie? Sergeant Papado. What doing? Uh, what? Why you only have one snowshoe? Well, that, that's what you said, Sergeant. You said bring the, your snowshoe. That is what I said. I said bring your snowshoe. Not your snowshoe. Your snowshoe. S snowshoe? Yes. Boat your snowshoe. Bring your snowshoe. That is what I said. Tabernacle. Now listen. You double away and you go and get your other snowshoe. Then you return and you come on me so that I may see you have both snowshoe. Okay? On and on, soldier. No, but Sergeant, the... The barracks is so far away, and, well, I'm sweating already. <laughs> Mackenzie, you think you sweat now? I make you sweat her, huh, Mackenzie? Maybe you would prefer to be in the cookhouse, huh? Making love to your little round pomme de terre. Pomme de terre? Hmm? I, why would I be making love in the cookhouse? I... Quoi? Mackenzie, snowshoe, maintenant. Then after, you go to the cookhouse. <laughs> Pomme de terre, gardez-vous. Pas de gymnastique, marche. Honestly, why didn't he say just bring both snowshoes? Here we are, late winter, nah, early spring, and that means only one thing. Uh, well, snow. <sighs> and rain. What a winning combination that is. But that can mean only one thing, that the days are getting longer. And that can mean only one thing, that it's time to start thinking about getting back into the bush. And that can mean only one thing. It's time for the cabin fever challenge. So here we are yet again for Cabin Fever 2023. Man, time marches on. Uh, conditions are, <laughs> let's call them sub subpar. It's just downright miserable right now. It's raining and well, you know. What do you do? The Cabin Fever Challenge is of course brought to us all by Rifle Chair of the Rifle Chair YouTube channel. Uh, this has become a yearly tradition that I greatly look forward to, and I, well, hope you do too. This year, I realized that perhaps the one rifle that has any business being shot at the Cabin Fever Challenge on this channel is my venerable P53, and I haven't used it to date. I don't know why, but on to other things, I guess. But I figured this is the year. So, in the guise of a Canadian militiaman, circa eh, mid-1860s, I thought the P-53 would have its moment. Now, if I could only master the kick turn. So what is the Cabin Fever Challenge anyway? Well, viewers of the channel, I'm sure, will be familiar with this friendly musketry competition. Uh, it's shot in one of four positions, uh, each in sequence. That's the standing, the kneeling, the prone, and the... Everyone together, the sitting, which is great in the snow. Uh, this time, uh, trousers, right on. Uh, there are multiple divisions. Um, this year, of course, being the P-53, this is the muzzle-loading division. And the target is set up, like that one over there, at 50 yards, or well, 50 meters. Uh, in the muzzleloading division, it's one round per position, shot in that sequence. And there's the formula. So, you plug your score and your time into that, and you come up with a number. And that is your score. The Cabin Fever Challenge has definitely grown up. 
It is in fact a global event, and there are entries from all over the planet. As I mentioned earlier, I'm shooting this year's competition in the guise of a Canadian militiaman of the 1860s, fur hat and all. Uh, I am right now wearing all the equipment, the knapsack and everything else. Um, I decided, however, I was going to shoot this year's competition in more of a light order. Uh, I did shoot in this knapsack before with this god-awful mess tin behind your head and, well, that didn't turn out too well. Uh, so I decided this year I'm going to leave it off uh, in the event of, you know, having to skirmish during the winter time, perhaps close to a garrison, the knapsack would have been left in camp. Anyway, that's what I'm going with. Anyway, enough of me blabbing. Let's get on with it. Oh, woman, I'm busy, okay? I have a competition. Regular viewers of the channel will be very familiar with the P-53 and its many cousins. These have been explored in depth in a series of videos, all of which can be found on the Enfield playlist. Mine is an early production Parker Hale, and these are generally considered to be the best reproductions made with regards to their heft, handling, rifling style, and their closeness to the fourth pattern rifles they are based on, their ahistorical markings notwithstanding. This was the rifle that launched the channel, and for that reason it has a special place in the collection. Speaking of things that launched the channel, Enfield ammunition is a subject I've spent many hours on. My version of the cartridge features a bullet that closely resembles the first pattern, or original Pritchett bullet, with a shallow cavity and no base plug. Through an exhaustive process, I determined that this version of the bullet performed the best in my rifle. It is rolled in a modern version of the contemporary service cartridge, the so-called English cartridge, as detailed in Brett Gibbons' book on that subject. Although made with modern materials for shooting and manufacturing economies, where the so-called rubber meets the road, it's much closer to the historical. The 540 grain bullet is wrapped in rag paper and lubricated with a mixture of grease and beeswax. The powder cylinder, as you can see here, is actually made of a piece of plastic tubing for ease of reusability. The mold is a custom-made example from Brooks Molds in Montana and has shown me no end of diligent and productive service for over 13 years. The cartridge is filled with 52.5 grains of 3F powder somewhat less than the service charge, which was 68 grains or 2.5 drams, but I found this load to be most accurate and gave a velocity in the mid 900 feet per second. Now admittedly, it's been a hot minute since I did any serious shooting with the P-53, so please forgive me. I did shoot a couple of warming rounds to confirm that things would be okay. At 50 meters, the binoculars were more than adequate to see the holes. This done, I was confident that the muzzle-loading gods would be forgiving despite the weather. So, with everything confirmed, it was time to launch. This year, it wasn't just the P-53 that I intended to bring to the challenge, but also the issue of snowshoes. The challenge is admittedly not very technical, that being part of its charm. And so my thoughts were that it would be a perfect form to try out a pair of traditional snowshoes. While I would not be traversing any ground, of course, the embuggerance of the unwieldy snowshoes and their effect on changing positions, and indeed shooting in those positions, was what I was keen to experience. Seen here, the use of the expense pouch was integral to personal drills of the late 1850s and 60s the ready supply of cartridges on the front of the belt being most welcome. Although not at all new to regular views of the channel, those that have never used or seen the British pattern service cartridge are really missing out. The lubricant proved to be the correct proportion for winter shooting, and the rounds loaded with the customary ease. By the 1860s this was a moot point, as all service ammunition used straight beeswax as a lubricant. <coughs> I did have to test and adjust slightly before beginning, and the positions of the snowshoes had to be within reason if my first transition to the kneeling position was to be smooth. I suppose that with getting ready for the first round my mind was a little bit elsewhere, and I evidently forgot one of the most important parts about shooting a percussion rifle musket. 
Wake up! Bring your rifle to full cock, you donkey! Uh, yeah. Time for the Cabin Fever Challenge starts with the first round being fired. Loading from the previously used fire position was what I had intended to do. This scheme proved to be most expedient. Transitioning to the kneeling was relatively easy. Proper foot placement to begin with was the key here. That and the shallow upward curve of the nose of the snowshoe, which mercifully did not project up into my shin as I knelt down. This would have been the case on snowshoes with a more pronounced curve. Loading of this third round was achieved using the technique known as loading as a front rank kneeling. The rifle was laid over the left thigh with the butt over the right foot, which I modify here slightly as room and snowshoes permitted. This was a commonly practiced movement, as indeed nearly all routine skirmishing took place in this position. Transitioning to the prone was smooth-ish. Obviously, it was more awkward than had it been done without the snowshoes, but an unintended benefit of the traditional and very simple bindings was that they flexed left and right, allowing for the foot to rotate, as you can see here. Rather than try to roll onto my back for the last load, itself a well-documented historical technique, I figured that trying to do so would result in a hot mess of rawhide and wood at my feet, and as entertaining as that might have been, Simply re-adopting the kneeling was the way to go. In retrospect, I could have loaded that last round as per a rear rank kneeling, which featured a different placement of the rifle, but I suppose that in the heat of the moment, the former technique was the better choice. Then came time for what was a bit of a wild card, the sitting. But the unintended consequence of sitting down on the tails of your snowshoes led to my right elbow and knee not being able to touch. As you can see here, I had to shoot that last round with a bit of a chicken wing. Come on, get up. Ah. So, time for the four rounds was 158, or 118 seconds. In these views, you can plainly see the paper shedding itself off of the bullet as it exits the muzzle. Well, there we have it, this year's Count Fear Challenge. Let's uh, see how we did. Oh. One, two, three, four. Slightly left, sort of the upper left quadrant, but they're all on target. The power of the Pritchett. <laughs> You can see here the position of the two warming shots. The first was off to the right, and after a slight correction, the second was pretty much spot on. The four shots of the challenge were admittedly a bit of a shock. I suppose the muzzle-loading gods were in a gracious mood this day. While the rifle will shoot like this easily from the prone, this group, from four different positions, was surprisingly small. So the score was thus. With four hits, in 118 seconds, the result was 16.9 points. As some may be aware, winter is a bit of a thing in Canada. And for that reason, perhaps a small comment on some of the kit used in the video. Military winter kit used by British forces and the Canadian militia can be defined by the use of snowshoes and various items of clothing, such as greatcoats, fur hats, winter boots and gloves, and what might be termed moccasins. Evidence of all can be confirmed through pictures and artwork. Snowshoes seem to be predominantly of the so-called Huron style. These feature regularly in period photographs. 
This would make some sense as the Huron or Wendat people predominated along the St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. This design featured a longer profile with a rounded toe and a narrow tail where the frame was joined. Bindings were of simple leather thongs. Winter footwear, officially for troops in British North America, was a pair of stout, tall leather boots. But there is evidence of the use of moccasins or other hide overshoes. These would be worn with thick socks and were held on the feet by leather laces. Great coats formed the main upper body garment, though these would have seen use as conditions required. Layers under the tunic or doublet, as the case may be, augmented by scarves and mittens, would have been common as conditions demanded. Winter headdress was a ubiquitous fur cap, sometimes known as the astrakhan. This simple wedge-shaped item is seen throughout the period, with either a rounded profile to its top, or sometimes with the top folded in, giving a much more square profile. This could be worn with or without a so-called bag, hanging down one side in the style of a Hazar's Busby. The astrakhan remains the only quote-unquote truly Canadian form of military headdress, and although it existed as an official item until the early 2000s, its use now is confined to the cadets of the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. Winter kit in British North America was a peculiar feature of service there. Harsh conditions led to the use of items not seen elsewhere in the Empire by both military and civilian entities and personnel. So, for this project, I elected to incorporate some of the features of Victorian winter kit. The cap is actually a modern example, as mentioned earlier, dating from the 1970s, from which I've removed the bag. Due to the rather temperate yet miserable conditions, I didn't elect to wear the greatcoat, but rather the 1863 militia tunic and a scarf. On my feet were a thick pair of wool socks with the trousers tucked in, covered by an economical, shall we say, pair of suede moccasins. These are commonly available items that I saw fit to represent the historical. The snowshoes are modern, traditionally made examples found at a thrift store. Their bindings are not just the simple leather straps, but are perhaps only one step up from those, serviceable nonetheless. The personal equipment featured the 1855 expense pouch holding 20 loose rounds, which was an inconsistent feature of Canadian militia kit in the 1860s, as well as the 1857 pattern cap pouch mounted on the pouch belt. The 20 rounds in the expense pouch were complemented by the remainder of the 60 rounds issued, held in the main pouch on the right hip. Inside was a tin to hold the four packets of ammunition and a reserve of caps in a small hinged compartment. Later, the 1859 pattern pouch would feature compartments for 50 rounds. In addition, the haversack and water bottle were added for extra encumbrance, although there are many examples where the militia did not even benefit from these basic items when defending the border from the Fenian threat in the 1860s. And the 1856 knapsack was worn for the introduction, but not shot with as alluded to in the video. All in all, it was a fun shoot, as it is every year, made all the better in this case by the incorporation of the winter kit and the P-53. Right, Brett? If you're in need of exceptionally high quality and historic ammunition for your P-53 Enfield, then stop by Brett's website, papercartridges.com. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. For more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page. As an alternative to YouTube, or Patreon, as indeed both these platforms have become somewhat troublesome for content as found on this channel, may I suggest following British muzzleloaders on Utreon. Link is in the description below.